part one of outside the prison this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by caroline outside the prison by richard harding davis part one it was about ten o'clock on the night before christmas and very cold christmas eve is a very much occupied evening everywhere in a newspaper office especially so and all of the twenty and odd reporters were out that night on assignments and conway and bronson were the only two remaining in the local room they were the very best of friends in the office and out of it but as the city editor had given conway the christmas eve story to write instead of bronson the latter was jealous and their relations were strained i use the word story in the newspaper sense where everything written for the paper is a story whether it is an obituary or a reading notice or a dramatic criticism or a descriptive account of the crowded streets and the lighted shop windows of a christmas eve conway had finished his story quite half an hour before and should have sent it out to be mutilated by the blue pencil of a copy editor but as the city editor had quite appeared at the door of the local room as though looking for some one to send out on another assignment both conway and bronson kept on steadily writing against time to keep him off until some one else came in conway had written his concluding paragraph a dozen times and bronson had conscientiously polished and repolished a three-line personal he was writing concerning a gentleman unknown to fame and who would remain unknown to fame until that paragraph appeared in print the city editor blocked the door for the third time and looked at bronson with a faint smile of sceptical appreciation is that very important he asked bronson said not very doubtfully as though he did not think his opinion should be trusted on such a matter and eyed the paragraph with critical interest conway rushed his pencil over his paper with the tip of his tongue showing between his teeth and became suddenly absorbed well then if you are not very busy said the city editor i wish you would go down to moya mensing they release that bank robber quinn to-night and it ought to make a good story he was sentenced for six years i think but has been commuted for good conduct and bad health there was a preliminary story about it in the paper this morning and you can get all the facts from that it's christmas eve and all that sort of thing and you ought to be able to make something of it there are certain stories written for a philadelphia newspaper that circle into print with the regularity of the seasons there is the first sunday in the park for example which comes on the first warm sunday in the spring and which is made up of a talk with a park policeman who guesses at the number of people who have passed through the gates that day and announcements of the repainting of the boat houses and the near approach of the open-air concerts you end this story with an allusion to the presence in the park of the one-faced children of the tenement and the worthy working men 
if it is a one-cent paper which the working men are likely to read and tell how they worshipped nature in the open air instead of saying that in place of going properly to church they sat around in their shirt sleeves and scattered eggshells and empty beer bottles and greasy sunday newspapers over the green grass for which the worthy men who do not work pay taxes then there is the hottest sunday in the park which comes up a month later when you increase the park policeman's former guess by fifteen thousand and give it a news value by adding a list of the small boys drowned in bathing the first hall of shad in the delaware is another reliable story as is also the first ice fit for skating in the park and then there is always the thanksgiving story when you ask the theatrical managers what they have to be thankful for and have them tell you for the best season that this theatre has ever known sir and offer you a pass for two and there is the new year's story when you interview the local celebrities as to what they most want for the new year and turn their commonplace replies into something clever there is also a story on christmas day and the one conway had just written on the street scenes of christmas eve after you have written one of these stories two or three times you find it just as easy to write it in the office as anywhere else one gentleman of my acquaintance did this most unsuccessfully he wrote his christmas day story with the aid of a directory and the file of a last year's paper from the year-old file he obtained the names of all the charitable institutions which made a practice of giving their charges presents and christmas trees and from the directory he drew the names of their presidents and boards of directors but he was unfortunately lacking in religious knowledge and a sense of humour he included all the jewish institutions on the list and they wrote to the paper and rather objected to being represented as decorating christmas trees or in any way celebrating that particular day but of all stale flat and unprofitable stories this releasing of prisoners from moyamensing was the worst it seemed to bronson that they were always releasing prisoners he wondered how they possibly left themselves enough to make a county prison worth while and the city editor for some reason always chose him to go down and see them come out as they were released at midnight and never did anything of moment when they were released but to immediately cross over to the nearest saloon with all their disreputable friends who had gathered to meet them it was trying to one whose regard for the truth was at first unshaken and whose imagination at last became exhausted so when bronson heard he had to release another prisoner in pathetic descriptive prose he lost heart and patience and rebelled andy he said sadly and impressively if i have written that story once i have written it twenty times i have described moya mensing with the moonlight falling on its walls i have described it with the walls shining in the rain i have described it covered with the pure white snow that falls on the just as well as on the criminal and i have made the bloodhounds in the jail-yard howl dismally 
and there are no bloodhounds as you very well know and i have made released convicts declare their intention to lead a better and a purer life when they only said if you's put anything in the paper about me i'll lay for you and i have made them fall on the necks of their weeping wives when they only asked did you bring me some tobacco i'm sick for a pipe and i will not write any more about it and if i do i will do it here in the office and that is all there is to it oh yes i think you will said the editor easily let some one else do it bronson pleaded some one who hasn't done the thing to death who will get a new point of view conway who had stopped writing and had been grinning at bronson over the city editor's back grew suddenly grave and absorbed and began to write again with feverish industry conway now he's great at that sort of thing he's the city editor laid a clipping from the morning paper on the desk and took a roll of bills from his pocket there's the preliminary story he said conway wrote it and it moved several good people to stop at the business office on their way downtown and leave something for the released convict's christmas dinner the story is a very good story and impressed them he went on counting out the bills as he spoke to the extent of fifty-five dollars you take that and give it to him and tell him to forget the past and keep to the narrow road and leave jointed jimmies alone that money will give you an excuse for talking to him and he may say something grateful to the paper and comment on its enterprise come now get up i've spoiled you two boys you've been sulking all the evening because conway got that story and now you are sulking because you have got a better one think of it getting out of prison after four years and on christmas eve it's a beautiful story just as it is but he added grimly you'll try to improve on it and grow maudlin i believe sometimes you'd turn a red light on the dying gladiator the conscientiously industrious conway now that his fear of being sent out again was at rest laughed at this with conciliatory mirth and bronson smiled sheepishly and peace was restored between them but as bronson capitulated he tried to make conditions can i take a cab he asked the city editor looked at his watch yes he said you'd better it's late and we go to the press early to-night remember and can i send my stuff down by the driver and go home bronson went on i can write it up there and leave the cab at fifteenth street near our house i don't want to come all the way downtown again no said the chief the driver might lose it or get drunk or something then can i take gallagher with me to bring it back asked bronson gallagher was one of the office boys the city editor stared at him grimly wouldn't you like a typewriter and conway to write the story for you and a hot supper sent after you he asked no gallagher will do bronson said End of part one. Part two of Outside the Prison by Richard Harding Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Part two. 
gallagher had his overcoat on and a nighthawk at the door when bronson came down the stairs and stopped to light a cigar in the hallway go to moyamensing said gallagher to the driver gallagher looked at the man to see if he would show himself sufficiently human to express surprise at their visiting such a place on such a night but the man only gathered up his reins impassively and gallagher stepped into the cab with a feeling of disappointment at having missed a point he rubbed the frosted panes and looked out with boyish interest at the passing holiday-makers the pavements were full of them and their bundles and the street as well with wavering lines of medical students and clerks blowing joyfully on the horns and pushing through the crowd with one hand on the shoulder of the man in front the christmas greens hung in long lines and only stopped where a street crossed and the shop fronts were so brilliant that the street was as light as day it was so light that bronson could read the clipping the city editor had given him what is it we are going on asked gallagher gallagher enjoyed many privileges they were given him principally i think because if they had not been given him he would have taken them he was very young and small but sturdily built and he had a general knowledge which was entertaining except when he happened to know more about anything than you did it was impossible to force him to respect your years for he knew all about you from the number of lines that had been cut off your last story to the amount of your very small salary and there was an awful simplicity about him and a certain sympathy or it may have been merely curiosity which showed itself towards every one with whom he came in contact so when he asked bronson what he was going to do bronson read the clipping in his hand aloud henry quinn bronson read who was sentenced to six years in moyamensing prison for the robbery of the second national bank at tackney will be liberated to-night his sentence has been commuted owing to good conduct and to the fact that for the last year he has been in very ill health quinn was night watchman at the tackney bank at the time of the robbery and as was shown at the trial was in reality merely the tool of the robbers he confessed to complicity in the robbery but disclaimed having any knowledge of the later whereabouts of the money which has never been recovered this was his first offence and he had up to the time of the robbery borne a very excellent reputation although but lately married his married life had been a most unhappy one his friends claiming that his wife and her mother were the most to blame quinn took to spending his evenings away from home and saw a great deal of a young woman who was supposed to have been the direct cause of his dishonesty he admitted in fact that it was to get money to enable him to leave the country with her that he agreed to assist the bank robbers the paper acknowledges the receipt of ten dollars from m j c to be given to quinn on his release also two dollars from cash and three from mary gallagher's comment on this was one of disdain there isn't much in that he said is there 
just a man that's done time once and they're letting him out now if it was kid mccoy or billy porter or someone like that eh gallagher had as high a regard for a string of aliases after a name as others have for a double line of k c b s and c s l s and a man who had offended but once was not worthy of his consideration and you will work in those bloodhounds again too i suppose he said gloomily the reporter pretended not to hear this and to doze in the corner and gallagher whistled softly to himself and twisted luxuriously on the cushions it was a half hour later when bronson awoke to find he had dozed in all seriousness as a sudden current of cold air cut in his face and he saw gallagher standing with his hand on the open door with the grey wall of the prison rising behind him moya mensing looks like a prison it is solidly awfully suggestive of the sternness of its duty and of the hopelessness of its failing in it it stands like a great fortress of the middle ages in a quadrangle of cheap brick and white dwelling-houses and a few mean shops and tawdry saloons it has the towers of a fortress the pillars of an egyptian temple but more impressive than either of these is the awful simplicity of the bare uncompromising wall that shuts out the prying eyes of the world and encloses those who are no longer of the world it is hard to imagine what effect it has on those who remain in the houses about it one would think they would sooner live overlooking a graveyard than such a place with its mystery and hopelessness and unending silence its hundreds of human inmates whom no one can see or hear but who one feels are there bronson as he looked up at the prison familiar as it was to him admitted that he felt all of this by a frown and a slight shrug of the shoulders you are to wait here until twelve he said to the driver of the night hawk don't go far away bronson and the boy walked to an oyster saloon that made one of the line of houses facing the gates of the prison on the opposite side of the street and seated themselves at one of the tables from which bronson could see out towards the northern entrance of the jail he told gallagher to eat something so that the saloon-keeper would make them welcome and allow them to remain and gallagher climbed up on a high chair and heard the man shout back his order to the kitchen with a faint smile of anticipation it was eleven o'clock but it was even then necessary to begin to watch as there was a tradition in the office that prisoners with influence were sometimes released before their sentence was quite fulfilled and bronson eyed the released prisoner's gate from across the top of his paper the electric lights before the prison showed every stone in its wall and turned the icy pavements into black mirrors of light on a church steeple a block away a round clock face told the minutes and bronson wondered if they dragged so slowly to him how tardily they must follow one another to the men in the prison who could not see the clock's face 
the office boy finished his supper and went out to explore the neighbourhood and came back later to say that it was growing colder and that he had found the driver in a saloon but that he was to all appearances still sober bronson suggested that he had better sacrifice himself once again and eat something of the good of the house and gallagher assented listlessly with the comment that one might as well be eaten as doing nothing he went out again restlessly and was gone for a quarter of an hour and bronson had re-read the day's paper and the signs on the wall and the clipping he had read before and was thinking of going out to find him when gallagher put his head and arm through the door and beckoned him from the outside bronson wrapped his coat up around his throat and followed him leisurely to the street gallagher halted at the curb and pointed across to the figure of a woman pacing up and down in the glare of the electric lights and making a conspicuous shadow on the white surface of the snow that lady said gallagher asked me what door they let the released prisoners out of and i said i didn't know but that i knew a young fellow who did bronson stood considering the possible value of this for a moment and then crossed the street slowly the woman looked up sharply as he approached but stood still if you are waiting to see quinn bronson said abruptly he will come out of that upper gate the green one with the iron spikes over it the woman stood motionless and looked at him doubtfully she was quite young and pretty but her face was drawn and wearied looking as though she were a convalescent or one who was in trouble she was one of the working class i am waiting for him myself bronson said to reassure her are you the girl answered vaguely did you try to see him she did not wait for an answer but went on nervously they wouldn't let me see him i have been here since noon i thought maybe he might get out before that and i'd be too late you are sure that is the gate are you some of them told me there was another and i was afraid i'd miss him i've waited so long she added then she asked you're a friend of his ain't you yes i suppose so bronson said i am waiting to give him some money yes i have some money too the girl said slowly not much then she looked at bronson eagerly and with a touch of suspicion and took a step backward you're not a friend of hern are you she asked sharply her whom do you mean asked bronson but gallagher interrupted him certainly not he said of course not the girl gave a satisfied nod and then turned to retrace her steps over the beat she had laid out for herself whom do you think she means asked bronson in a whisper his wife i suppose gallagher answered impatiently End of part two part three of outside the prison by richard harding davis this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline part three the girl came back as if finding some comfort in their presence she's inside now 
with a nod of her head towards the prison her and her mother they come in a cab she added as if that circumstance made it a little harder to bear and when i asked if i could see him the man at the gate said he had orders not i suppose she gave him them orders don't you think so she did not wait for a reply but went on as though she had been watching alone so long that it was a relief to speak to some one how much money have you got she asked bronson told her fifty-five dollars the girl laughed sadly i only got fifteen dollars that ain't much is it that's all i could make i've been sick that and the fifteen i sent the paper was it you that did you send any money to the paper asked bronson yes i sent fifteen dollars i thought maybe i wouldn't get to speak to him if she came out with him and i wanted him to have the money so i sent it to the paper and asked them to see he got it i give it under three names i give my initials and cash and just my name mary i wanted him to know it was me give it i suppose they'll send it all right fifteen dollars don't look like much against fifty-five dollars does it she took a small roll of bills from her pocket and smiled down at them her hands were bare and bronson saw that they were chapped and rough she rubbed them one over the other and smiled at him wearily bronson could not place her in the story he was about to write it was a new and unlooked-for element and one that promised to be of moment he took the roll of bills from his pocket and handed them to her you might as well give him this too he said i will be here until he comes out and it makes no difference who gives him the money so long as he gets it the girl smiled confusedly the show of confidence seemed to please her but she said no i'd rather not you see it isn't mine and i did work for this holding out her own roll of money she looked up at him steadily then paused for a moment and then said almost defiantly do you know who i am i can guess bronson said yes i suppose you can the girl answered well you can believe it or not just as you please as though he had accused her of something but before god it wasn't my doings she pointed with a wave of her hands towards the prison wall i did not know it was for me he helped them get the money until he said so on the stand i didn't know he was thinking about running off with me at all i guess i'd have gone if he had asked me but i didn't put him up to it as they said i'd done i knew he cared for me a lot but i didn't think he cared as much as that his wife she stopped and seemed to consider her words carefully as if to be quite fair in what she said his wife i guess didn't know just how to treat him she was too fond of going out and having company at the house when he was away nights watching at the bank when they was first married she used to go down to the bank and sit up with him to keep him company but it was lonesome there in the dark and she give it up she was always fond of company and having men around her and her mother are a good deal alike henry used to grumble about it and then she'd get mad and that's how it begun and then the neighbors talked too it was after that that he got to coming to see me i was living out in service then and he used to stop to see me on his way back from the bank about seven in the morning when i was up in the kitchen getting breakfast i'd give him a cup of coffee or something and that's how we got acquainted 
she turned her face away and looked at the lights farther down the street they said a good deal about me and him that wasn't true there was a pause and then she looked at bronson again i told him he ought to stop coming to see me and to make it up with his wife but he said he liked me best i couldn't help his saying that could i if he did then he then this come he nodded to the jail and they blamed me for it they said that i stood in with the bank robbers and was working with them they said they used me for to get him to help them she lifted her face to the boy and the man and they saw that her eyes were wet and that her face was quivering that's likely isn't it she demanded with a sob she stood for a moment looking at the great iron gate and then at the clock face glowing dully through the falling snow it showed a quarter to twelve when he was put away she went on sadly i started in to wait for him and to save something against his coming out i only got three dollars a week and my keep but i had saved one hundred and thirty dollars up to last april and then i took sick and it all went to the doctor and for medicines i didn't want to spend it that way but i couldn't die and not see him sometimes i thought it would be better if i did die and save the money for him and then there wouldn't be any more trouble anyway but i couldn't make up my mind to do it i did go without taking medicines they laid out for me for three days but i had to live i just had to sometimes i think i ought to have given up and not tried to get well what do you think bronson shook his head and cleared his throat as if he were going to speak but said nothing gallagher was looking up at the girl with large open eyes bronson wondered if any woman would ever love him as much as that or if he would ever love any woman so it made him feel lonesome and he shook his head well he said impatiently well that's all that's how it is she said she's been living on there at tackney with her mother she kept seeing as many men as before and kept getting pitied all the same everybody was so sorry for her when he was took so bad that time a year ago with his lungs they said in tackney that if he died she'd marry charlie oakes the conductor he's always going to see her them that knew her knew me and i got word about how henry was getting on i couldn't see him because she told lies about me to the warden and they wouldn't let me but i got word about him he's been fearfully sick just lately he caught a cold walking in the yard and it got down to his lungs that's why they are letting him out they say he's changed so i wonder if i'm changed much she said i've fallen off since i was ill she passed her hands slowly over her face with a touch of vanity that hurt bronson somehow and he wished he might tell her how pretty she still was do you think he'll know me she asked do you think she'll let me speak to him i don't know how can i tell said the reporter sharply he was strangely nervous and upset he could see no way out of it the girl seemed to be telling the truth and yet the man's wife was with him and by his side as she should be and this woman had no place on the scene and could mean nothing but trouble to herself and to every one else come he said abruptly we had better be getting up there it's only five minutes to twelve 
the girl turned with a quick start and walked on ahead of them up the drive leading between the snow-covered grass plots that stretched from the pavement to the wall of the prison she moved unsteadily and slowly and bronson saw that she was shivering either from excitement or the cold i guess said gallagher in an awed whisper that there's going to be a scrap shut up said bronson they stopped a few yards before the great green double gate with a smaller door cut in one of its halves and with the light from a big lantern shining down on them they could not see the clock face from where they stood and when bronson took out his watch and looked at it the girl turned her face to his appealingly but did not speak it will only be a little while now he said gently he thought he had never seen so much trouble and fear and anxiety in so young a face and he moved towards her and said in a whisper as though those inside could hear him control yourself if you can and then added doubtfully and still in a whisper you can take my arm if you need it the girl shook her head dumbly but took a step nearer him as if for protection and turned her eyes fearfully towards the gate the minutes passed on slowly but with intense significance and they stood so still that they could hear the wind playing through the wires of the electric light back of them and the clicking of the icicles as they dropped from the edge of the prison wall to the stones at their feet and then slowly and laboriously and like a knell the great gong of the prison sounded the first stroke of twelve but before it had counted three there came suddenly from all the city about them a great chorus of clanging bells and the shrieks and tooting of whistles and the booming of cannon from far downtown the big bell of the state house with its prestige and historic dignity back of it tried to give the time but the other bells raced past it and beat out on the cold crisp air joyously and uproariously from kensington to the skykill and from far across the neck over the marshes and frozen ponds came the dull roar of the guns at the navy yard and from the delaware the hoarse tootings of the ferry boats and the sharp shrieks of the tugs until the heavens seemed to rock and swing with the great welcome gallagher looked up quickly with a queer awed smile it's christmas he said and then he nodded doubtfully towards benson and said merry christmas sir it had come to the waiting holiday crowd downtown around the state house to the captain of the tug fog bound on the river to the engineer sweeping across the white fields and sounding his welcome with his hands on the bell cord to the prisoners beyond the walls and to the children all over the land watching their stockings at the foot of their beds and then the three were instantly drawn down to earth again by the near sharp click of opening bolts and locks and the green gates swung heavily in before them the jail-yard was light with whitewash 
and two great lamps in front of round reflectors shone with blinding force in their faces and made them start suddenly backward as though they had been caught in the act and held in a circle of a policeman's lantern in the middle of the yard was the carriage in which the prisoner's wife and her mother had come and around it stood the wardens and turnkeys in their blue and gold uniforms they saw them dimly from behind the glare of the carriage lamps that shone in their faces and saw the horses moving slowly towards them and the driver holding up their heads as they slipped and slid on the icy stones the girl put her hand on bronson's arm and clinched it with her fingers but her eyes were on the advancing carriage the horses slipped nearer to them and passed them and the lights from the lamps now showed their backs and the paving stones beyond them and left the cab in partial darkness it was a four-seated carriage with a movable top opening into two halves at the centre it had been closed when the cab first entered the prison a few hours before but now its top was thrown back and they could see that it held the two women who sat facing each other on the farther side and on the side nearer them stretching from the forward seat to the top of the back was a plain board coffin prison made and painted black the girl at benson's side gave something between a cry and a shriek that turned him sick for an instant and that made the office boy drop his head between his shoulders as though some one had struck at him from above even the horses shied with sudden panic towards one another and the driver pulled them in with an oath of consternation and threw himself forward to look beneath their hoofs and as the carriage stopped the girl sprang in between the wheels and threw her arms across the lid of the coffin and laid her face down upon the boards that were already damp with the falling snow henry 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 she moaned the surgeon who attended the prisoner through the sickness that had cheated the country of three hours of his sentence ran out from the hurrying crowd of wardens and drew the girl slowly and gently away and the two women moved on triumphantly with their sorry victory bronson gave his copy to gallagher to take to the office and gallagher laid it and the roll of money on the city editor's desk and then so the chief related afterwards moved off quickly to the door the chief looked up from his proofs and touched the roll of money with his pencil here what's this he asked wouldn't he take it gallagher stopped and straightened himself as though about to tell with proper dramatic effect the story of the night's adventure and then as though the awe of it still hung upon him backed slowly to the door and said confusedly no sir he was he didn't need it End of part three end of outside the prison recorded by carolyn in istanbul turkey in june two thousand and fifteen thank you for listening